gates. So um, Hanke is an Austrian director. Uh, he started making films for TV in 1974 when he was 32. Um, and his first feature film, The Seventh Continent, the one I sent to Kanye, made in 1989 when he was 47 years old. Um, and I think it's about then that he started to rise in prominence and be known as a big, important filmmaking guy. Um, but he has a really, he has an unusual style that I think he's developed over the years. If you look at his early films, like the one, uh, The Seventh Continent, um, and maybe so the Seventh Continent, and then Benny's video, Funny Games, Seventy One Fragments of a Chronology of Chancellors, first early films. They're mostly uh, influenced by Brisson in terms of the cinematography. That's the really close shots that he does of everything, and I'll show you maybe some examples of this. After that, he started to develop what I think is his own style, which is. Really unusual, and I suppose breaks a lot of rules if anyone can hear about rules. Um, first point I picked up on is that he has a lack of composition. I watched uh, uh, making off of his film Code Unknown, and he made them redo a shot because he said it looked too composed. It looked too nice the way that people were walking in. He wanted more people making a mess to make it look more like reality. Um, he does long takes and minimal editing because he says he doesn't want to mess with the flow of time says that filmmaking is kind of a, it is a manipulation of time, but if, in his <coughs> mind, if you let it run in real time and interrupt it as little as possible, then you're doing less of a manipulation. It's one argument you can make. Um, lots of tripod shots, so lots of just still camera, staying at a distance, unmoving for a long time, sometimes tracking shots, but I think you don't often get the sense that there's anything human controlling the camera. Hi. Here's a quote I found in the A reply that I've repressed even a constipated style, mainly static frames from our observer the distance, holding an emotion as well as information, keeping from viewers that the viewers know the characters and what the characters know about themselves. Um, as I interpreted that, he has less interest in resolving mysteries than in observing the characters react to them. Often in his later films, something mysterious will happen, and you think the point is that you're going to learn who did it. But you never do. What you do learn is how people react to the thing that has happened. And I think often the point is that he, the director, is the one who did it. And that's why he never says what it is. He did this to the characters. So you never, he's never going to appear in front of the camera and say he did. Um, and there's evidence to back that up in his films as well, actually. Um, he, there's this um, theatre style called, there was a theatre director called Bertolt Brecht. And he came up with this style called Brechtian alienation, which is where, to make the familiar or familiar, you draw attention to the construct of drama. The most famous one, I suppose, is breaking the fourth wall. When you do that, suddenly, you know, the, the filmmakers are acknowledging it's a film. If, if they turn and talk directly to the camera, then it's like, okay, clearly they're acknowledging that the camera is there, which you're not typically supposed to do if you want this to, if you're pretending that this is real. Um, but there's often, um, There's other ways to do that. I'll, I'll show. I'll show some clips and explain that. Um, this film doesn't really have a score. There's often there's rarely any music. If there is, it's all diegetic, which you remember is uh, in the film the piano teacher. People play the piano in it because that's what we would do. And so there is music in the film, but it's not piano playing added by someone in post anything. Um, so this, I think, is. <coughs> One of my favorite examples of something that he does, um, that we'll talk about it after this. Tom, I think you know this, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, bit of an unusual film opening, can we say? Um, what was going on there? How did we, what did we learn about the characters? Has anybody else seen the film? No. Have you seen it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, I think the intro is kind of, uh, or the soundtrack, like everything that you can hear, is kind of a compression of the rest of the film. 
So you have this wonderful domestic bliss. It's like that, like a, they look like they're in a nice car, they're nice people, they're listening to nice music. They've obviously got some money, they're not poor people, and they're listening to like lovely classical music. And then all of a sudden, just abruptly, it changes and there's this horrible music that even if you were into punk or rock or heavy metal, you wouldn't like that. It's, it's like, unpleasant. Yeah, it's unpleasant, it's awkward to listen to, it's, um, you kind of want it to stop and you don't know where it's going next yeah. and it's just painful and irritating but the visual doesn't change and that is a kind of, uh, and that's what happens in the rest of the film like that it so it goes back to the beautiful domestic bliss mm. and this lovely existence and then turns into a horrible nightmare that you just want to stop and that's what i think they've done with mm. the, the opening yeah. very good point um something i just realized when i was talking about diegetic music like the music they're playing is interrupted by music that is non-diegetic yeah. that's added by the filmmaker mm. it's basically like the filmmaker is going to ruin their lives because he's the one who writes what happens to them. <laughs> and later in the film, it's uh, without too many spoilers, so there's like a home invasion of these characters, and the people who invade the home talk to the camera sometimes. And they say, like, you want them to survive, don't you? Mm -hmm. Like, normally at this point in the film, they would get to escape, and then they just they don't let them escape. Um, mm -hmm. So, what genre could you say the film was? <clears throat> art house horror. I would agree. Because I think it takes the, the conventions of a thriller, which is like a home invasion, but it doesn't give you the payoff that that does. Yeah. In fact, it quite deliberately withholds um, the expected route of, of how the story is going to go. Um, and that, I would say, is an example of Breath and Alienation, where it draws attention to what traditional plot is and then tells you how life generally goes. Mm -hmm. You're not maybe you're not going to be the hero of your story, maybe you're not going to have an explanation for something bad that happens to you. Which I think is often the exact opposite of how a screenwriter might tell you what to do. How a film, like, do you think any filmmaker would say, put in really horrible music three minutes in to, to really annoy your viewers? Nobody's going to tell you to do that. But if you have to do it for the sake of what you're going to do, then do it, you know? That's why Hanukkah to me, I think, is exemplary of a guy who shows that... Okay, so if you start making films late in life, you obviously knew the rules and then broke them. You can say that, maybe. I don't think you necessarily need to know the rules then break them, because I don't agree that there are all those rules. Um, but he's praised and imitated for doing things that you're technically not supposed to do. You're not supposed to compose your shots badly. Um, you're not supposed to annoy or upset your viewers, and that's all he does. <laughs> Um, it's, it's worth mentioning on that point actually mm. that uh, this is actually a, the one that we just watched. It's actually a remake. Yes. Uh, he previously made it in French. Austrian. Austria. Yeah. In, in Australia. So he, he previously made it, and lots of people talked about how badly constructed some of his shots were. Mm -hmm. But um, if anyone's interested, <coughs> you can go and watch on YouTube, and there's a side by side comparison of when they arrive at their destination and it's the Austrian version and the American version side by side and although it seems like random and thrown together and badly edited it's actually exactly the same mm. and and I think that's and I and I love that because you can see that it is like he's there is a method to what he's doing yeah. mm. it isn't just random yeah. it yeah. looks messy but it's in his very precise messy mm. way yeah. uh, <laughs> They is pushing the limits, right? A lot. <coughs> the first, the beginning, it's really, uh, it makes the, gives the idea of a least family, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't need to push it so long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, well, it's also it, it was slow and dragging it. Like, yes, mm -hmm. it and then the funny games title, right? In red, just mm -hmm. in the angle. So he's pushing all the limits, uh, mm -hmm. at least, yeah. Yeah, how about the titles? Do you think there are going to be some funny games? <laughs> Not really. Um, but also, uh, I would say, Connie and I picked up on The Seventh Continent, the first film, that his colour palette is really bland as well. This family seems really boring to me. Um, they play this little game to try and work out who knows what classical music. Like, 
give me a break, you know? Mm. Also, um, <coughs> how are we introduced to them? How long, it takes you so long to see their faces. Mm. Mm. You see the overhead of a boat and a car, and you hear their voices and you hear their music, and then you see their hands picking up the CDs and stuff before you get to see who they are. Yeah. And about the, how slow it was until they showed their hands and then yes. before see the face. Thank you, yeah, he has a unique way of showing off the characters. And I think an example of that for some cinematography is to close up with the hands grabbing the CDs and stuff uh, as a first introduction to a character is kind of unusual, I think. Um, shocking, painful, inappropriate music choice, perhaps. How do we know it's deliberate? Um, because he knows what good music is. He's played canon music to begin with. So what I mean is like it's not some mistake, he's not some weirdo. He's like, the audience is going to love this. He knows it's going to shock you. Yeah, it's too awful to be. Like maybe this will work with those shots. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. You know, yeah. When I cut to the family of the cut, like when I when you finally show their faces, this will be really nice for everyone to listen to. It's like too extreme to be. Yeah. I totally agree. Um, okay, yeah. Here's another clip um, from this film, The Seventh Continent. And so this is, uh, so Funny Games, the US version, I think, came out in the early 2000s. And this is 11 years earlier. But like I say, since he began late in life, I think from the beginning he's had quite a... He knows what his style is from the beginning. And this being his first film. Okay, and I think you see that character again later in one more scene. He says goodbye to them as they drive off on a trip. That's his entire character arc is that one scene, I think. Um, or do you think that scene might play out if, if some different director was handling it? What, what might they do differently? I, I think they would give more reasoning. Like, with him, like when I watched it as well, I was waiting to see why is the girl looking at the guy like that, like in, in a special way. Mm. And why did he start crying? And why does, <coughs> like I was trying to find the reason and, and waiting for, for the solution, mm. and it never came. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think that's one of the differences, and, and, and how slow it is, and all the small reactions that they each have, it pauses on their faces. Mm. It's awkward, isn't it? It's really awkward. Mm. Um, again, not, not very, I guess it's like an unpleasant watch, isn't it? <laughs> it's not nice to see. Yeah. Uh, I guess if anyone else had a scene like that, it would have to be either like context leading up to it, mm. or but like a payoff afterwards. Yes. Like an explanation afterwards. I haven't seen this. Oh, it's very good. Yeah. Like, um, but yeah, you would have to have a reason for that to happen. Mm. Mm. You couldn't just throw it in there. Mm. Mm. Yeah. That's all we learned about that guy. Um, so what would I say there? Again, I think from the first film, it's more about the the reaction to the mystery than the mystery itself. Mm. Um, I think his point is that we don't often get to learn why things happen to us. Yeah. Um, it's more similar to real life. Yeah. Because yeah. you can be on a, at a dinner table and this might happen and you might never find out why. Mm. So this is more similar to that. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. But it's weird because I think we look to stories for explanations, don't we? It's weird to see a story that deliberately withholds them. Mm. Um, and also the dialogue is really banal as well. They're just chewing for a lot of it, and then they're like, oh, she added salt, mm -hmm. and pepper, a bit chilli. I think maybe the chilli he didn't like that, so he started crying for those. <laughs> no, <laughs> the yeah. music, like, it seemed like the music bothered him, but he wasn't admitting it first. And yes. then when he turns it down, he says, thank you. Yes, absolutely, yeah. You yeah. know, like this small, like this subtle communication between people, he shows that. It totally draws attention to it. I think what, what we might be able to say about him as a character is he's somebody who doesn't ask for what he wants in life. Mm -hmm. And if that's the only information we get, because it's amplified by the fact that we get nothing else, mm -hmm. then I guess that's, well, that's the conclusion I have to draw, I suppose. Um, I guess it's who, um, there's a context as, as well as like, <coughs> who at the table are you, you like, Who's the main character and whose point of view are you seeing this from? Because mm. it, it, it would make sense a lot from the child. Because if it's the child seeing it, she might just remember a time that her uncle came 
and had dinner and in the middle of the dinner I started crying and I never found out why mm. and I just left mm. and that would be really typical from a child's perspective yeah. that they never, they didn't understand and it was never explained to them why that happened. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. Mm. Last clip, um, this is his latest film Happy End that came out in 2017. Does anyone want to bet if it actually has a happy end or not, <laughs> given what we know about Hankin so far? Um, it didn't get as good reviews, but I actually like it. I think it's one of his only films that has any comedy in it, to be fair. Um, more colour. A little bit more bright right. colour. Okay, so here we see a guy doing karaoke of a famous song. I want you to think about his interpretation of it compared to what you know about the song. Um, What the hell is going on there? Was that from this film? Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, at least for once. You know, I mean, none of the none of the stuff I showed you previously was very funny. Um, think about if somebody think about another film you might see somebody and the scene directions were like he sings Sia's Chandelier in a karaoke scene. How would that be directed differently from that? Way more cuts for one, yeah. Um, like there'd be way more reaction shots mm -hmm. like from the, the crowd. And if he was having a break, then there would be lots of kind of abstract, pit, like point of view, like him, like the microphone and the camera, like what he can see. And it wouldn't just be like a locked off tripod shot, like you said at the start. Mm. Like I haven't seen this either. But I'm assuming he's having a break then. <laughs> he's an alcoholic and he's very drunk. Yeah. Um, yeah, it looked like he was very drunk. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's just there by himself. I don't think he knows anyone there. He's like the rich son of, I, I believe, like an oil baron or a coal mining family. Um, yeah, and he's just, just losing his mind. I think it's a great film. I think you should watch, like, if you're going to watch Hanukkah films, watch this one last because it doesn't do anything new it really unites all of his themes from all of his previous films. So you'll see like, um, the, uh, Amur was a very famous Hanukkah film and the same characters come back in this film. Um, there's a psychopathic child, which there is in Benny's video, his first film. There's like the commentary about banal middle-class life, which there's in The Seventh Continent. So it's kind of like a fun revisiting of everything he's done really. And also there's humor in it. So I really like it from that perspective. Um, but I think people argued it wasn't, it wasn't new. Which is fine. Um, yes, and then again, what I've said is, uh, yeah, it draws attention to the to the construct of um, films. I think by being so different. So yeah, I, I already covered in Friday Night Pizza the short film that we did. How I used like locked off tripod shots and made it very awkward because. Well, I didn't realize how much I've just done the Hanukkah thing. Friday Night Pizza sounds like a lot of fun, but it isn't. Funny games, happy end. They sound great, but they don't happen. Um, Locked off tripod shots, awkwardness in the pacing, very long shots. Um, but okay, yeah, I've got another shot from one of my films that I want to show you that I consider influenced by this style. Um, okay, <laughs> a lot of very intense stuff. Always very intense. Um, so. I had filmed that from other angles, I think. I'd filmed it from Sam's perspective, falling down, and I said a few more lines, but then I realized that it was probably, it was more interesting if it was just awkward and sudden and unexpected, and then um, cuts to black as well. Because I think you notice when you're editing something that if you fade in and out, and if you cross fade, and if you cross dissolve, and the music is always ramping up slowly and back down, it's a very smooth experience for the viewer, but if you, cut to black, then it's, it's much more shocking. Um, but then I'd watch Hanukkah films and I thought, hey, you can shock people if you want. It's okay, he does it, I can do it. Um, so I think sometimes people, sometimes other filmmakers in their style give you permission to do things. Um, I had similar very noisy music at the beginning of Truth and It, our first film. Um, basically, I got a lot of mileage out of that funny games clip I just showed you, <laughs> I really like it. Um, did anyone here did the director Ruben Östlund, I suppose you say, a Swedish guy? Uh, Force Majeure, The Square. 
Nope. Um, the Square is a very good film. It's very funny. Um, it's super awkward. And it's like a very Scandinavian sense of humor. And I think they, they were like, oh, you can be this awkward and you'll get prizes. There's, nobody should have told the Scandinavians that because they were like, oh, look how awkward this is. Um, the Square, I think, is a very good film. Um, Yorgos Lanthimos, heard of him? The Lobster? Uh, who was that? What was his name? Yorgos Lanthimos, Greek guy. Uh, the Lobster, Killing of the Sacred Deer, The Favourite, and Dogtooth are all very awkward films. Um, particularly, like, the dialogue in The Lobster is, is constantly on the nose. Everyone is just saying exactly what they're doing in, in a way that it's like deliberately badly written dialogue. Um, and it's kind of, it's really hard. It's not just the dialogue, it's the way it's like delivered as well. It's kind of like massively underacted. Mm. It's like just like a real, they are just saying the words like this and the woman just replies like that. Mm -hmm. It's bizarre. Yeah. Uh, I think they don't look at each other. Sorry? They do, but they speak very flatly. There's no emotion behind the words. So the, the conceit is that they have to go to a hotel and find a partner, and if they don't, they'll be turned into their favorite animal. So the protagonist picks a lobster. Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember any of the lines. I think they just say, that like, okay, they're going to go off to get married, and if that doesn't work, they can have some kids. That will probably hold them together. Okay, next. <laughs> yeah, it's this kind of, like, it's like a science fiction kind of dystopian thing, but done in like a really interesting way. Uh, yeah. mm. Or as you might say, also the thing is both film with a repertory of precise, bright, fixed frames. Blah, 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 blah. I found this from a New Yorker article about a guy who analyzes film, and I thought that's interesting. Um, I have no idea what it means, but I think my point is that like lots of people think if you can talk like this, you can make a film when this is actually the domain of like media appreciation and cultural like film criticism, which is an entirely different discipline. I think that if you're making films, you do something more like I do, which is you just kind of go, oh, that's cool, I'm going to do that. You don't have to be able to put, articulate it like this. <laughs> um, plus, he's saying it's a bad thing, I think. Oh, OK. So then I ranked all of his films, Hanukkah's films, oh, cool. in my opinion. Starting with the top ones, I think Seventh Continent's first one is great. Then Benny's video is also great. Funny games, um, like Tom was saying, there's a version made in Austria that's in German, and there's a US version. I think you only need to watch the US version because they're the same film. They're shot by shot. Even I think the timing of everything is exactly the same. But the US one is better acted, and it's his film was for a US audience because I think it's critical of the torture porn genre. Yeah. Mm. Um, the Pianist? No, not The Pianist. Uh, the, the Piano Teacher, it's called in English. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's what I have seen. You've seen that one? I think so. French film. This uh, French film, a woman who injures herself and she falls in love with a young student? Yeah, I've seen it. Okay. It's very good, and the book is great as well. Um, so basically, it's about like she, she and a bunch of small, and a small dedicated group of people work hours and hours and hours a day to perfect performances of Schubert and Mozart and so on. And so she's just insanely repressed, it seems. So when it comes to a relationship, she has very specific things she wants the person she's in a relationship to do, which are quite violent and strange. Um, and I think he's asking, like, does she have a right to ask for those things, or is there something up with her? And I don't know at the end. Um, again, I, I don't think Hanukkah is providing answers. Um, Amur is pretty good. It's his most famous one. It's pretty horrible, though. Um, it's about a woman who has a stroke, and her older husband has to look after her. And as you can imagine, in the Hanukkah style, it's a lot of just like trying to feed her, trying to walk her around the apartment for very lengthy periods of time. So OK, a great dedication to realism, but quite unpleasant. Um, Happy End, like I say, is funny and accessible and a good one to watch once you've watched the other ones. Um, White Ribbon is a bit like a Bergman film. It's about a small German town, I think, in like 1910 or something like that. It's filmed in black and white. Um, people are... Starts with a wire is strung up to trip up a horse and injure it, and they think that the kids of the town are doing it. Um, but of course, Hanukkah style, spoiler, you never find out who does it. It's more just about how the town reacts. Um, Time of the Wolf is not very great. 
Um, it's a family go to a cabin, and then they find people in the cabin who are stealing supplies from it, and they capture them hostage, and then it's a dystopian world, and nobody can escape, and they never explain why. And they, both, they mostly just sit in a train station waiting for a train and argue with each other. <laughs> I wouldn't bother. Um, and these ones I find really dated. Cachet is one that people often talk about as being a very good Hanukkah film. Um, but that one and Code Unknown and 71 Fragments, I think, come from an era of early 2000s like morality tale films about like white guilt. Like that film Crash. Remember that film Crash won yeah. tons of awards? So there was like a boom in pandering crap in that era, and I think these films are very dated as a result. I mean, like even this one that's so praised, I, I deliberately put this poster on it where it's like this guy, his wife, and he's mildly angry at a guy who's like almost, almost hit him with his bike. And that's about the most thrilling thing that happened in it. So they put it on the poster. Oh, watch this, the guy's gonna get mildly angry at a guy. <laughs> Drink his bike, it's five stars, wins. Ugh, I hate it. Um, final thoughts. When I first started writing, um, I was interested in the kind of stuff that helps you escape, like magical realism, sci-fi, and um, making worlds and people seem really beautiful and interesting and like people you would want to know. And it, it took me a really long time to figure out that actually what I had to say about life is that a lot of it's kind of dull and shocking. Um, <laughs> so people like Hanukkah have figured that out and have realized that maybe that's what they have the most interesting thing to say. I don't understand people, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I'm not having a great time, this isn't very interesting. These are all very human things that should be expressed and, and they feel like things that you should eliminate from your style or, or not develop, I think. And this is why it took me such a long time to think of doing it myself. Um, and that's why I say it always feels at first that the raw material of your own life is somehow unimportant or not worth mentioning. Um, when in fact everything you've observed about life is the most important thing you have to give to your art because it's the only thing that you can do. Um, you might not have like amazingly unique things to say, you might not have a lot of nice things to say, but you just gotta say them anyway. Um, yeah, that's why I say my own experience of life, I'm a very sensitive person, I find it very loud and confusing. Especially here in Norway, I've got no idea. Like every time I have a meeting, and then somebody says something, I'm like, ah, are they pleased? Do they hate me? Is I, did I do a good job? I've got no idea. Constantly, I've been here for years. Um, so yeah, I feel like that's what I have to express a lot of the time. Um, and that's okay, like whatever you have to express is okay. And that's, I think, my lesson from Hanukkah. Um, yes, so I mean, I, I spent a lot of time I don't have any formal training, so I spent a lot of time learning filmmaking from YouTube. And if you do that, it's all going to be about like how to create a, an exciting Instagram brand and make a beach look beautiful. Um, but maybe you want to make a beach look ugly. Maybe you hate beaches. Maybe that's what you want to put out. It's not going to get you a big Instagram following, but it might be what you have to say that's important in a film. Um, and that's okay. Uh, Mary Carr is a memoir writer. She teaches at some big college. Um, I think it's the Iowa Writers Workshop, which is one of the fanciest places you can go to study writing. And she has a book called The Art of Memoir. And she gives lists of uh, points that you should include in your style as a memoir writer after giving her favorite chapters from various memoirs that she likes. And then after these lists, she says, but by the way, um, in the interest of developing your own style, you will need to not do some or maybe all of these things. Um, And so that's my point. I don't think there are really rules. I think you, I think there's an excuse to do anything in your style that that it might that it might require. If you think there's a reason to do something, you can do it. There's no rule against anything you want to feel like doing. Um, and yeah, obviously do your due diligence if you can. Like I don't know, showing up here, watching a presentation, doing a bit of practice, reading some books, watching some YouTube videos. I'm not going to say that you don't need, that those things aren't useful, but um, if you have something you intuitively want to try, just do it, you know? And here's some other things you want to, you might want to try. There's a new documentary about Hanukkah coming out this year, apparently, I couldn't find it anywhere. There's another one, Michael H. Profession Director, came out a few years ago, can't find that. There's this film, Mikhail, by, uh, God, where's he? I think he's Austrian as well. 
It's a very Hanukkah-esque film. Um, this video about uh, Hanukkah and Brisson will explain how Hanukkah uses Brisson cinematography. It's quite interesting. It's just clips of The Seventh Continent, that film, but with quotes from Brisson's book on cinematography to explain why what you're seeing is the way it is. Yes, that's all. Cheers. Ha, ha, ha.